Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you guys today about my birth story. And I actually wasn't even planning to film this video, but I got some requests to film it, so I figured, why not? And it's been um, eight months since I've had my little guy. His name is Arlo Maxwell. We're not gonna put his last name in, but whatever, that's him. Um, I, like I said, I gave birth to him eight months ago to, on April 15th, I was thinking of what eight months would be in December, um, but on the 15th, it will, he will be officially eight months old, but <clears throat> I gave birth to him on April 15th, which this year coincidentally was not tax day because of COVID. So I wanted to share my story because I gave birth during COVID, during the pandemic and all of that, like right in the midst of it all. Um, and I kind of wanted to share it with you guys, A, because um, I don't know if you will find comfort in this because maybe you're delivering during COVID or maybe you're just having a baby regardless. And then also I wanted to share it with you because I didn't realize until I just thought back that everything that could happen pretty much happened during my birth story. Um, and yeah, it was a crazy ride and I want to kind of talk to you guys about it. So yeah, it's kind of nuts. I'm going to try to remember as much as I can because, again, it was eight months ago. I didn't film a labor and delivery vlog. Um, Alright, so to start with, my pregnancy was pretty normal. Um, I didn't have any complications um, or anything like that until I want to say I was 32 or 36 weeks, probably 32 weeks. Um, I went in for my routine doctor's appointment and well this must have been before COVID really like hit hit because Scott was still allowed to go to the doctors with me. It was a I want to say it was like a Friday or something and we just had a big breakfast. He had made me this like bagel, steak, cheese and um, egg sandwich, breakfast sandwich. It was delicious. Anyways, besides the story, uh, besides the point. Um, so we go to the doctors and um, she's doing the fetal like monitoring thing and with the Doppler or something. I've n also should preface, I'm not a doctor. I don't know medical terms. I'm just telling you my story, right? So um, she does it and she notices that his heart rate is just really high and it's not decreasing. And so obviously I just had a coffee and a huge breakfast. So I thought, okay, it's just because that, whatever. But she wanted me to go down to the hospital because my OBG was in my hospital was in the hospital and so by the way in case you were wondering I gave birth at Baylor Dallas um it's really close to our home and one of our friends had gotten um had given birth there so that's where I went to anyways um so she made me go down to um the hospital and get monitoring for an hour to just make sure that his heart rate did went down and in fact it did so we were fine but I had to stick away from coffee for the rest of my pregnancy and chocolate and anything with caffeine in it and I had no idea also that cocoa butter has trace amounts of caffeine so I wasn't allowed to use cocoa butter not that I use that but some people use it for their stretch marks but anyways um so that was the major complication that we did or the minor complication that we had during pregnancy and then I go in um, for like my last couple checkups and then it happens like once a week when you're in, you know, that last stretch. And um, she was like, you're dilating, you're a face, like I think you're going to have this baby. My due date was actually the 11th. Um, that was what was projected to be and that was, um, that had come and gone. <laughs> and so she had um, set me up for, my Friday was my last appointment and she's like, you know, um, if you don't give birth over this weekend, which was Easter weekend, um, you're going to be induced on Wednesday. And the reason they do that is because, uh, she didn't want me to go too far over 40 weeks. Every doctor and every hospital is different. So at the end of the day, like with a pandemic, everything is different. And I know everyone's story is going to look a little bit different. I'm just sharing mine. Okay. Um, so anyways, I go in and she's like, on Wednesday, the 15th, you will be induced, uh, or on the 14th, you will be induced. Um, the only reason it was Wednesday is because that's when she's in the hospital. So my doctor's office had five doctors there, five OBGs, and they would rotate, obviously, because that's just how they did. They were working mothers, which I loved. I thought that was such a cool idea. And um, they would they would rotate. So if 
it was, so if she was gonna plan the induction, it had to be on the day that she was working. So, but if I had gone naturally, it wouldn't have been with her. It would have been with a different doctor in the office. And what I also loved is they like rotated me throughout my visits during my prenatal care um, to see all those doctors. So it was really awesome. So in case I had to go with anybody, it would have been a familiar face. But they said, um, so I visited her on Friday. And again, I wasn't a my fiance wasn't able to go to doctor's office or doctor's appointments towards the last like half of it um, because of COVID and all that good stuff or bad stuff, terrible stuff. So we go in on Friday and she's like, oh my God, you're a face, you're dilated. I don't remember the, the amount because whatever. She's like, you're, you're going to give birth this weekend. I know it. Um, if you do, I'll be here, um, tonight. So if you go in tonight, awesome, cool. I'll be here on Saturday. This will be your doctor. And then on Sunday, honestly, though, we pair with a different doctor's office on holiday weekends. We like rotate so that doctors can have off on weekend or holiday weekends and stuff, which again, I totally understand work-life balance and stuff. And she was saying it would be, um, this male doctor that I've never met before. Again, no problem is what it is. Um, um, obviously a little uncomfortable because I'd never met him, but again, whatever. It is what it is, right? I'm sure he's amazing. And she assured me that honestly, he was the one that just delivered her baby. So I was like, okay, cool. And I loved my doctor. So I trusted her, everything. So the weekend comes and goes, Monday comes and goes, Tuesday comes and goes, and Wednesday's here and still nothing. You guys, I tried everything. I was like curb stomping the, you know, up and down on the curbs. I was bouncing on a ball. I was eating pineapple. I was everything that I could possibly do. And it just was not working. So Wednesday came and I had to be um, admitted to the hospital. So 6 p.m. was when we were supposed to go in. So we went in at 6 p.m., had all of our stuff all packed up, which is one nice thing about induction is like you can prepare for that. Um, but I didn't want to. So as a backstory to all of that, I took birthing classes um, to, we took birthing classes on the, the I guess the medicated side and like all the things that, they, that could happen, even though I wanted to go natural and unmedicated because I wanted to know everything that could possibly happen. And I'm really freaking glad I did because just wait, everything happened. So we took classes on that. So I knew everything that happened and we actually took it in the hospital in which I get birth to or birth at. So yeah, I took birthing classes, but my plan was, my birthing plan was natural, unmedicated. And my doctor knew that. And I was very clear. My fiance knew that and my nurses knew that. But at the end of the day, I had to be induced. It is what it is. Their job is to get this baby out as safe and healthy as possible. And I am totally for that. So Going at 6 p.m., um, had the best nurse ever. She was so sweet, but I had to be, um, she put what was called Cervidil, I believe, on my cervix, which is supposed to thin it um, and increase, um, or supposed to thin your cervix to, you know, dilate you, all that good stuff. Again, not a doctor. So I had that and then I was monitored all night long. And during that process, she would check. I didn't sleep at all because she would check my um, heart rate like every hour or so and just make sure everything was going well. I was contracting, so she honestly was like, girl, I don't even think you're gonna need to have Pitocin or be induced. I think you're literally going to go in naturally overnight. And I was like, heck yes, because this is what I want. Um, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so anyways, comes and goes. And then 6 a.m. is when they um, admit me into the labor and delivery place and I am put on Pitocin. So again, it wasn't um, my plan, but at the end of the day, like, you know, doctors and nurses know what they're doing and you have to obviously have a plan and a goal, but be able to, to go with it, you know, when things happen, because that's, that's life, you know? So um, I'm put on Pitocin. And the other thing I really didn't want is I did not want to be fetal monitored, like hooked up to the machines and not be able to move. And that had to happen because Arlo's heartbeat before was a little irregular. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that it was, he was monitored fine. And, um, yeah, it was not what I wanted because I wanted to be able to walk around because I had heard that if you're moving you're walking and you're not just laying down, you're going to progress in labor quicker. And I wasn't able to experience that. But again, I know the doctors know what they're doing. So trusted that. Um, so labored probably for like, uh, on Pitocin, probably for, I don't know, 6 a.m., probably until like three or something. The contractions were rough, you guys. Like I was, did not have an epidural. Um, I hadn't eaten in over 12, plus 12 hours at that point. And 
um, yeah, they were rough. Like I just, you know, breathe through it. Um, so I would just breathe through it. I changed different positions and different stuff like that, but I had to be for the most part on the bed. So that was that was not progressing. So at that point she was like, okay, what do you think about, I think she was like, I think we should try the Foley balloon. I believe that's how you call it. I don't know. Whew, you guys, I'm glad I also learned about this in my class, but I'm really sad that I had to experience it because it freaking hurt like hell. So, um, it is a balloon that they put up into the cervix, I believe, and pump it full of saline solution. Every time she pumped it full of saline solution, I thought I was gonna die. That was probably one of the roughest parts. And I had this balloon in me and it really hurt and it was making my contractions so much more painful. And it was also supposed to dilate me. So it was supposed to put pressure on the cervix to dilate it. So I believe it was up in my like uterus womb area. It was supposed to put pressure on um, to, you know, dilate me quicker. Cause that was my problem. I was not dilating quick enough with the Pitocin. Now the risk of that is popping or breaking your water. And then if that happens then they literally have to go right into um, a C-section because if you're not dilated enough and your water breaks, then yeah, it's not, it's not good. So to avoid infection and all that good stuff. So I don't know why I say all good stuff because it's not good stuff. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so she does the balloon. It's in there for a couple of hours. They're pumping it full of solution. And she's like, okay, I'm ready to, you know, check it out and see how everything's going. During this time, mind you, his heart rate is still a little irregular when I have contractions. So um, that happened. And then she takes the balloon out, which was ah, so insanely painful. So insanely painful. And she's like, don't worry, like we'll get this out. And then 90% of people will start to dilate as soon as this comes out, because it's just like, you can relax a little bit more and yada, yada, yada. So checks again in a couple hours, not dilated, <laughs> not dilated anymore. Um, and then she tells me with his heart rate because it is not regular and you're and you're having some complication complications with it I'm going to um, I'm going to recommend a, a c-section and now honestly c-section natural unmedicated whatever everything is your choice and your you know completely like I'm not judging anyone who's had that that's not what I'm here to do I'm literally here to tell you what my goal was going into something which I think everyone should have a goal and game plan um and then what what actually happened so I was really upset when she had said c-section only because I had labored for so long this was what I really wanted to do um and that was just not what I wanted but if if that's what you want again no judgment here how it comes out healthy babies the best baby. So she had told me I'm going to need a C-section and I was like, Oh my God. So not going to happen naturally. And now she also told me I have two options. She knew I did not want to be medicated. I did not want the epidural, even though I had already had Pitocin, which is medication, which Pitocin is like, I believe the body produces, it's most similar to oxytocin, which is the labor and delivery drug that like sends your body into labor. Again, not a doctor. So um, she's telling me, yeah, you need an epidural or you're going to be knocked out during the birth of your child and you're not going to see it. And so obviously at that point I was feeling really, really upset and defeated at that point. And she's like, I'm going to give you another hour, see what happens. But just due to Arlo's heart rate, I am concerned and I want to make sure that, you know, this baby comes out as safe as possible. And I was like, you know what? Me too. So we got to do, we got to do. So that guy comes in to get, to administer the epidural amazing guy so freaking sweet loved him he was joking it was great as soon as i had that epidural you guys i was like hallelujah it was the best thing of the entire world <laughs> um honestly i could have labored through the contractions my doctor was like you're handling it like a champ and i'm like i know but it hurts like crazy but anyways so i get the epidural and i'm able to finally like relax you guys i took a nap for the first time at this point i had been up since like this is like 24 hours at this point um, when, when they administered the epidural, I think it was around 6 PM and, um, yeah, I was able to relax, take a nap. <laughs> my fiance was watching the monitoring and he was like, Oh my God, you're having a contraction. And I was like, I don't feel like I am. 
I feel like I'm sleeping. So then during that time I'm relaxing, I'm getting some sleep and the doctor comes in and they're like, baby's heart rate is really not doing well. So they want to do what is called, and I can't remember it, it's the internal monitoring. This was the scariest part for me, you guys. Um, I, she had another, um, she was going in for a C-section then, so she couldn't fit me in right now, or right then, so she was like, we're gonna do, I'm gonna administer internal monitoring. This is something I learned in class, and I was so freaking scared about it, because it goes in and, like, attaches, it's a sensor that attaches into his skull and monitors his, his, like, heart rate and everything and vitals more accurately than just on my stomach but I just like at that point I was like oh my god like I'm harming my baby like I, I get it it's not harm but it felt like I was literally attaching something into the skull not me personally but that was really really hard for me and honestly insanely painful because they had to go all the way up and attach this to his skull and it was just that was really hard but they were at that point able to monitor him a little bit better and um and all that so they kept turning me every so often so that I wasn't on his umbilical cord. He just wasn't doing well when I was contracting. Um, but then when I had the epidural, he started to relax and I relaxed and everything started to progress. And then um, she came in after her C-section, looked at his monitoring and said, let's take this thing out and see where you're at. Saw where I was at. She's like, we're ready to go. And I'm like, okay. So at that point I'd had the Pitocin, I'd had the balloon, I had had the internal monitoring, all things I didn't want, but I was sure as heck glad that I learned that in my class, so I highly recommend taking those classes, even the ones that you don't plan on doing, just so that you're fully aware of everything that could happen. Um, so anyways, uh, she was like, all right, so let's take this out, see where you're at, you're ready to go, let's push. And so at that point it was like nine o'clock at night, so I had been um, at the hospital for what, 28 hours, 27 hours, um, no food, obviously starving. You know, a lot of people labor for longer than I did, but it was rough, okay? And so um, I start pushing everything and she's like, you know, I push for a couple minutes, push, 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 and she's like, we just, we need to get him out of here. His heart rate is dipping again. We don't want this to continue to happen. And so the whole NICU team, by the way, is in the room at this point. So there's about 20 nurses, uh, not the whole NICU team, but the NICU team is in the room, about 20 nurses in and out at all times because they're concerned about his heart rate. And so she's like, another doctor is in there and she's like, I think we need to vacuum assist another thing I'm just like oh my god I feel like I can't why can't I just do this why is it so difficult but whatever anyways the vacuum assist so if you don't know what that is it's a suction that goes on the back of the baby's head and they literally like pull him out <laughs> and so yeah they then had to do that so I pushed a couple more times pushed with the vacuum and out popped Arlo popped yes um and that was him. 9.29 p.m. on April 15th, little sweet Arlo was born into this world, stubborn as can be because he not only didn't want to come out, they needed to try every single freaking thing that there is in labor and delivery to get this little guy out of there. He just was like, I'm still chilling, mom. I'm not ready to get out. I made it really comfortable for him in there and I was feeding him really good food, so I don't blame him. But anyways, yeah, I thought, um, it would be fun to share that story with you guys because honestly everything that could happen pretty much happened during my my um, labor and delivery. It was not my plan again and I wanted to share with that with you guys. It's like it's very important to go in with a plan and have your mindset because it is a very mentally and physically draining thing. So it's good to go in with like a goal and a mindset and a, you know I'm gonna get this but it's also very very important that you follow the directions of the doctors and the nurses because they're there for obviously you know the safety of your baby. So we had the baby, everything is great. My nurses, doctors were all freaking phenomenal, loved them all, was really, really happy that I was still able to give birth to Arlo <laughs> naturally, v vaginally, <laughs> let's put it that way. Everything else was still used, so there was nothing natural about that thing. But anywho, <laughs> um, then I, we got admitted to labor and delivery, like the actual like room or whatever. 
we were there for a while. I was in some serious pain. I did rip in two spots. Um, so I had some stitches, but nothing else besides that. I know a lot of people have some serious complications after birth or can. Um, and thankfully I had two small tears, but it was not pain or is not, not a fun time. Um, so we're in the room. Arlo's having some issues latching, um, breastfeeding. And so I'd seen a couple of different lactation consultants and it still just wasn't happening. It wasn't gaining enough weight uh, to be um, what discharged from the hospital. And so on the last day, the pediatrician saw him and she said, you know, you guys have a choice, but I would stay in the hospital another night. Uh, um to see if he will eat so at that point we were like oh my god like we were so ready to get out of here we just like it was it's a lot when you're like surrounded by nurses all the time and you just want to like be home and you're in your space and whatever it's just it's a lot of feelings and so he wasn't latching he wasn't getting enough and my milk had just not come in so at that point we had some options whether we were going to use this is past the birth story but <laughs> anyways um whether we were going to use donor milk or formula, I really wanted him to be breast milk. So we went with donor milk for a little while. And then, um, we, yeah, so we agreed to do donor milk and we did SNS, 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 SNS tube feeding. <sighs> Guys, you guys, that was process. Um, and so we did that for a little while. And then the nurse had come in after the pediatrician and she said, honestly, like if it was me, like I, I'm not like, you know, giving you this advice. I'm giving you my, or I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you my advice. Go home. Your milk will come in at home. You'll be much more relaxed. You have an appointment first thing Saturday morning. This was on Friday. You have an appointment first thing on Saturday morning to see a pediatrician. If he's not doing well, you can come back. We but honestly, decided to leave the hospital it was the greatest thing. We did end up introducing formula into Arlo's diet because that was just what we needed to do at that time. And he's currently on formula and it's okay. I want to just preface that at the end um if you guys want to hear about my breastfeeding journey and story um that was very short-lived it was it's it's just really hard that whole process and I think I will link a youtuber down below that helped me so much through the process of like understanding um you know postpartum and all of that and if you guys want to see more from me I definitely can share my story um I've only had one baby but it's still I guess it could be helpful so if you guys want to see more of that like things that people don't tell you about postpartum and pregnancy and birth and all that good stuff. I can definitely film that for you guys. But um, this is where I'll end my birth story. Uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. I hope you found it enjoying, enjoy, enjoyment out of it. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, I guess it's comforting during these times to hear, you know, other people that have gone through something similar to you or you don't know what could happen. Um, I never watched many of these because I was afraid and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. But like I said, depending on where you get your education from, whether it's watching videos, again, I'm not like a doctor, reading books, um, anything like that, highly recommend. I can't, I don't see my book that I read. I've read multiple books, but I will link um, the book. I'll show you the picture of the book here. Definitely recommend that book if you're pregnant. It's amazing. I'll link it down below as well. If you get one book and read one book, it is so easy to read. It is so just like straight to the point. Love it. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, let me know what other kind of baby birthing childhood videos you want to see from me. I'm not an expert, like I said, clearly, but I love you guys so much. I hope you guys enjoyed. And if you are pregnant, congratulations. So excited for you guys. If you are, if you are a mother, a great job. Congratulations again. Um, and I will see you guys all in my next video.